You're listening to Emerging Global by BNE Intelli News. Hello and welcome to another episode of Emerging Global. Um, I'm your host, Daniel Rad, and I'm happy to say I'm joined today by our South American correspondent, Matthew Cohen. Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so you are now a specialist in um, the economies of South America. Specifically today, we're going to be talking about Argentina, that country that's now put itself back on the map with its uh, anarcho-capitalist president, um, Javier Milei. Can you tell us more about what he's doing at the moment in terms of uh, his uh, outreach? I know this week he's in Germany meeting with the uh, Germans to sign lithium deals so the Germans can continue to make cars. But it's also caused a bit of controversy uh, meeting with the uh, far-right alternative für Deutschland uh, this week as well. Yes, so um, currently he's on his uh, European tour. Um, he's meant to stop in both Germany and Spain where he's supposed to receive an award for his uh, libertarian achievements. Um, his return to Europe is a rather controversial one, uh, particularly due to the feud that he's had with uh, the Spanish authorities. Um, not so long ago, he was in Madrid um, for a rally prior to the European Parliament elections um, for the Vox Party, which is, again, one of the further right parties in Spain, uh, fairly aligned in terms of policy to the Millet administration, um, where he called out the Spanish Prime Minister, P uh, Pedro Sanchez, and um, insulted his wife uh, with allegations of corruption. So his return to uh, Europe um, will be a fascinating one, no, whether or not he will attempt to sort of mend ties with the current Spanish administration remains to be seen. The uh, issue he has with the Spanish currently is um, they're very socialist, is that right? And he's uh, uh, very much a capitalist, so he uh, he doesn't like them too much. Is that is that is that how it's perceived? Yes, that is how it's perceived. Um, he has actually taken to uh, calling Pedro Sanchez a socialist, and uh, in in uh, and given the context in which he said it, it's very much to be taken as an as an insult. What is he doing currently to the Argentine uh, system uh, to change uh, Argentina? Uh, many people may know and they may not know. Argentina has been a Peronist government, which is a very unique thing in the sense that it's nationalist and socialist and has been like that for several decades, uh, turning what Argentina... Uh, into one of the poorest economies in the world uh, with massive inflation uh, and a depreciating currency. The Argentines have uh, overwhelmingly voted to try and get out of their um, cul-de-sac, as you say, and they are now looking to uh, move forward and try and rebuild their economy. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, so... Given his libertarian stance, um, Javier Millet is very much for small government and mass privatization. Currently, his administration is in the process of attempting to get his omnibus bill to pass through Congress and into law. In its original form, the bill had over 600 clauses. However, the it's been a lot of opposition against the bill, uh, particularly in Congress, and especially because um, Javier Millet's political party only has a minority of seats. In fact, in the Senate, they only have about seven seats. And so they require um, cooperation with other parties in order to get it over the line. So from over 600 uh, clauses, there's now only about just over 200 articles um, due to such a bulk of the bill being rejected. So at the moment, um, actually back in April, 
the Senate and the upper house approved the latest um, iteration of the bill and it is currently being debated in the lower house. And so if the lower house um, does decide to approve this bill, then it will go into law in its final form. And when that goes into its final form and hopefully um, it goes through, uh, what do you think that will achieve for the Argentine economy? So it will have a major impact on Millet's agenda because a very large part of his vision is mass privatization. So we're talking, first of all, about the oil and gas company, uh, Energia Argentina. We're also speaking about the state-owned news agency, and we're also speaking about the national airline um, Aerolíneas uh, Argentinas. Ew. And so... What Millet is really looking to do is to firstly improve operational performance. However, he's also looking to lift a large amount of government controls, um, particularly when you look at uh, operations in the Vaca Muerta shell formation and you look at fuel prices, for example. Um, no longer are the days that the government will dictate these prices. He's hoping that... Um, through deregulation, um, the suppliers themselves will be debating prices and foster a little bit more competition within the marketplace. And um, he's been very active on the diplomatic scene. Like this week, you say he's in, in Europe again, he's meeting with the Germans, he's trying to sign contracts with them. But has he also been, you know, uh, reaching out to international institutions like the World Bank and stuff? Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So Argentina, prior to Millet's inauguration, already had an existing uh, lending program with the, inter with the International Monetary Fund. Um, so if you recall um, the Davos conference a few months ago, mm -hmm. as well as more recent meetings, um, he has been corresponding quite frequently with the IMF in order to ensure that the program remains on track. And it appears um, through statements from the IMF that they are fairly impressed with his economic approach to date. They do seem to be... Um, very supportive of his decisions to slash state spending. Um, in February, the government was able to achieve its first fiscal surplus since around 2008. And so the IMF is very supportive of that. Mm -hmm. And in its latest review of Argentina's um, economic situation, um, they have decided that, yes, the country remains on track to reaching its fiscal objectives in terms of the deal, and they will be releasing the latest payment. Sort of movement in terms of uh, foreign direct investment. He has had quite a large amount of uh, meetings planned with, uh, with tech giants such as Apple, um, OpenAI, Sam Altman, Elon Musk, who heads up uh, Starlink and Tesla. And it does appear as if Millet is pursuing an agenda of, first of all, increasing foreign direct investments into the country, but also he does seem to have a vision for establishing a sort of AI hub within Argentina. Mm -hmm. And um, Argentina has not historically been known as a tech hub. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So that's great. Argentina has definitely not uh, been known as a tech hub um, historically. The majority of Argentina's economic prosperity, um, although I use that term loosely because, of course, as we know, it's been in the doldrums lately, but the majority of where it has been able to um, draw its finances from has mostly been through minerals and natural resources. Um, I do know that for Javier Millet, improving the lithium production of the country is of paramount importance. Argentina does have... And it has one of the largest uh, um, deposits, right? 
Correct. Um, so Argentina is known to be part of the lithium triangle, um, together with uh, Bolivia and uh, Chile. And one of the areas where tech and lithium, of course, um, combined would be the emerging electric vehicle market. And so one of Mille's ambitions is really to boost the lithium production within the country. And he does see that as quite a large contributor to GDP growth going forward. Um, on the other hand, energy, specifically natural gas and oil, also happens to be a crucial pillar to this agenda, specifically due to the massive reserves contained within the Vaca Muerta shale formation. Um, Argentina's uh, relations with European countries have been covered here, but uh, recently they've made uh, some changes to their claims on regional disputes, including the uh, Falkland Islands, or as they call it, the Islas Malvinas. Um, can you tell us more about that? Because, you know, previously in his election campaign, he praised Margaret Thatcher, uh, who was, you know, uh, at war with the country uh, during the 1980s. Yes, that's correct. Um, of course, the Alas Malvinas is a very sensitive topic due to the fact that there was the armed conflict in which um, there were civilians and soldiers on both sides that perished. Um, ultimately, it was the United Kingdom and still is the United Kingdom who retains that territory. However, although the Malay administration has reiterated its desire to claim the Andes Malvinas for Argentina, it does appear that they have softened a lot of their rhetoric um, and not quite as aggressive as prior to his inauguration. Um, in fact, the foreign minister, Diana Mondino, explained that while it is important to the Malay administration to, to claim this territory, they do want to do so diplomatically without compromising their relationship with the United Kingdom. And so while there is still that ambition there, it does appear that in a lot of areas, the Malay administration has very much um, turned down their aggressive sort of sentiment that they adopted prior to the election. Why do you think that is? Do you think they have it, want to have better connections with the UK? Yes, I, I do. I do believe that it's that that is um, part of the issue. However, I feel that the crux of the issue is that once you are in power and you have that responsibility, it's not so easy to blast off that sort of um, extreme rhetoric anymore. We need to remember that although Millet has been elected as the president of the nation, his Libertarian Party actually holds very few seats in Congress, um, not nearly the same amount of seats that larger that parties, for example, within the United States, where you have very much a direct presidential election, would hold. And so for him, every single move that is made will need the consensus consensus of his partners, of his political partners. So you mentioned that he doesn't really have much of a majority, but he has had a bit of a bounce um, since he got elected in as president. Yes, it does seem that that is the case. Um, according to his government's data and from surveys that they've conducted, they believe that um, Argentines were about... About 85% of Argentines were feeling disillusioned about the current situation. However, this figure's dropped to about 65% over the six months that he was in, in office since his inauguration. So it does appear that Argentines are gradually warming up to his administration, um, although it could also be a case of moderation, Um just to backtrack to the points that I was making earlier, the fact that he has to caucus with pretend with coalition with potential partners has very much resulted in him having to moderate many of his views 
as is the case with um, the omnibus bill, which is currently being de debated from around 600 um, parts, the bill is now just over 200. Could you tell us more about that bill? What, what, what does that entail? So the omnibus, omnibus bill is a massive undertaking. I'm not sure if you know this, but since being inaugurated in December last year, not a single piece of legislation has been passed into law by the Mine administration. Now, the reason for that is because he's taken a rather extreme approach where he is looking to implement his economic agenda or shock therapy, as he likes to call it, through one massive omnibus bill. Now, in its current form, the bill has actually been split into eight sections, and each section is being voted by Congress um, individually. And so one would, one would assume that that is being done um, to allow a little bit of ease of passage, because of course, if you're going to vote for this entire bill, um, there's going to be a large amount of deliberation, and the timeline will of course extend. Um, in terms of what the bill contains, the first uh, major point that I would say is the privatization, as we previously discussed. On the other hand, it does also look to establish emergency legislative powers for the Miller administration. Uh, we, and really what this will allow is for him to implement um, the government controls that he is that he intends to implement um, specifically in terms of the country's finances but also in terms of energy related issues and um, there are certain subsidies and grants that he was looking to pass through we do know that he also has the agenda of looking to alleviate much of the sort of pricing bottlenecks that are being um, experienced, particularly in terms of fuel, oil, natural gas. But you, you, but the bottlenecks is due to subsidies, I assume, um, and the state heavily subsidizing and supporting industry over the past few decades. So, you know, he's going in with a, a wrecking ball to rip up what was there before the opposition he has to his rule is, at the moment, um, it, well, it appears from the outside, doesn't it? it he, he seems to be getting away with a lot more at the moment. But as time goes on, the, the opposition will continue to build up against him. So how, how long do you think he's got before he hits the rocks? That very largely depends on the approach that he takes. And say that because... Just on the note of the opposition that's built up, that is correct. A large amount of the public opposition, as well as that from trade unions and from opposition parliamentarians, comes as a result of his decision to slash public spending. And so what we have seen is a significant slash in spending in industries such as the film industry, However, we've also seen the spill into education, where a large amount of protests have already taken place, where the opponents to his administration have claimed that slash making such subsidy cuts will indeed um, limit the standard of or lower the standard of education of the country. So I think that a very large factor that will depend how long he has is how well he does to first of all appease those opponents but second of all still ensure that his economic agenda by far and large is able to progress because we do have to remember that while you do have this short-term pain that Argentines are experiencing you know with poverty levels surging towards 50% and triple digit inflation still being a major problem. The long-term implications of his economic agenda may prove to be fruitful. And it does appear, if we look at um, 
macroeconomic data that it is taking a positive tra trajectory, both in terms of the inflation rate cooling, but also in terms of achieving that fiscal surplus. Well, you've already moved on to projecting uh, into the future. So with that regards, how do you think he'll fare over the next few years? Do you think he's going to secure his power base with the support of international actors and companies and governments? Uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier, Elon Musk is supportive of him and, you know, the Germans want to sign deals for the lithium uh, supply so they can compete with the Chinese in car production moving forward. So, you know, um, how do you see his next few years? I do believe that he has a very strong probability of succeeding. However, again, that really depends first and foremost on his rhetoric that he displays to the public because public opinion will always matter no matter how good um, the economy appears to be performing on paper. And secondly, it also depends, like you said, on the sort of foreign relations that he is able to maintain. And of course, uh, mending a lot of the rifts that have already been caused while he may objectively or subjectively appear correct in terms of the way that he views um, nations such as Brazil and its uh, socialist ruler, Spain and the Sanchez administration, or perhaps the Middle East conflict or the Ukraine conflict. The issue at hand is that he has already caused several rifts with world leaders. Um, we do know that, um, of course, he needs to. There, there is this uh, rift between with rifts with Spain, which it does appear that um, they are attempting to mend, if um, the foreign minister's words are to be believed. And then, of course, um, it really just depends on whether or not he is able to take those relationships forward. For example, um, he has had quite a backlash against what he would consider the socialist or communist powers, including China. But we also need to remember that China is one of the largest trade partners that Argentina has, as well as a country that it has been heavily indebted to. And so ultimately, I think that his success will largely depend on how he is able to navigate these types of relationships and ultimately win over the Argentine public because while businesses and Argentine business people may be slowly but surely coming over to the Malay side, he may still have a very large issue with winning over the trade unions and particularly those Argentines who are impoverished. So let's see how he does over the next few months. And if you're interested in learning more about you know the macroeconomic data and how things are happening in Argentina. The Intellinews.com has a South America subscription feed that you can uh, read on. Uh, Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Is it if anybody can reach out to you, how would they do that? Do you have a socials that you can re people can reach out to you on? Uh, yes, I am available on uh, LinkedIn. Um, just have to search for Matthew Cohen. And I do also respond to email at uh, mattcohen01 at gmail.com. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Yeah.